Hi everyone, Christine from Big Vision here. Um, we are here for our first episode of our Socializing Sober series. We are very excited for this. Uh, we will be uh, sharing some tips, strategies, um, all things Socializing Sober, talking about the NA drink space today. And I am joined here today with Elva Ramirez. Thank you so much for joining us, Elva. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks. Um, so, Big Vision, we are a nonprofit. We are all about sustaining your recovery through um, events, lifestyle, community, connection, um, in person events, and virtual offerings like this one. We are a nonprofit, so your donations help us in so many ways. Um, if you would not mind checking out our website, bigvisioncommunity.com, you're able to make a donation there, and you're also able to see our upcoming events. So, check that out. So, Elva. You are the author of this beautiful book, Zero Proof 90 Non-Alcoholic Recipes for Mindful Drinking. It is gorgeous. Um, I think it should be a staple in everyone's sober, sober bar at home. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and your book. Uh, I'm a spirits reporter based in New York City. I've been covering spirits and lifestyle for many years. And in 2018, I wrote an article about the how different bartenders in New York were experimenting with non-alcoholic cocktails. Uh, it was right when Steve Lip entered uh, the, U the U.S. after being quite successful in the U.K. Uh, that was that came out in March 2018, and then a few months later, I was approached to expand the idea into a book. And fast forward a few years, and here we are. So the premise of the book is: What do the world's best bartenders do when they can't use booze? So the example I always give is. If you have a French trained chef, for example, and you ask him to make something vegan, he's still going to bring all his training, even if he can't use cream or butter. So it's the same idea, um, what can bartenders make when you just say, okay, well you can't use alcohol, but what else can you give me? So it's very much geared towards uh, people who love cocktails, but don't want to drink or want to drink less. And that actually makes up the majority of people who um, drink, but also sometimes don't, as well as the people in the recovery space. And it, the book has recipes, but it also tells the history of the temperance movement um, going back to colonial America all the way up to the future, or the future, the present, sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean, it, it is the future. The future of this space, exactly, <laughs> it is the future yes. of this space. <laughs> um, so you had uh, an article about you um, in the post, and there was this quote, and I, I liked it. Um, American social culture is a drinking culture. We've always been suspicious of people who don't drink. What's different now is that there's a deluge of new products on the market and the fact that not drinking is seen as an individual choice, not something to be ashamed of. And that, that quote stuck with me because it's so true that everything now is like, I mean, it, it's a drinking event. Everything is a drinking event. You go to a baseball game, drinks. You're going to a wedding, drinks. You're going to a party, drink. Like, it's everywhere. And now, I mean, even planning big vision events, we see like, we're, you know, we'll try and do uh, a bowling event and the bar is the big scene there. Or, you know, we were doing um, uh, those wrecking rooms where you like take TVs and stuff like that and you destroy them. And they even have bars there, which I, I, to me, I don't think it's a great idea to drink and then destroy stuff, but to each his own. But yes, drinking is really central in so many things. So it's, it's important, especially, you know, now that we're having this conversation that we're doing this series to help educate and, and equip everyone with the tools necessary to feel empowered when you're going to events and when you're going to parties and, and just even hanging out with friends. Um, and it's important, especially, you know, your book shares a lot of fun, elevated ways to enhance, you know, the drink in your hand right. without alcohol. So there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, to borrow, yes. to borrow, to borrow <laughs> a quote from that we see a lot. American culture is drinking culture, and that goes back to the beginning of basically before America was America, and so I'm going to compress a lot of history into a, a few sentences. But there was a time uh, when the colonies were founded when water was very unsafe to drink, and so you could only drink beer, you could only drink whiskey. There, the, even children drank something that was like a very, it was very, it was small beer. It was very low, it was very low in alcohol, but it was what you could drink to not get sick. And sometimes even milk made you sick because of the the cows ate the wrong kind of weeds, then you would get sick. So, so Americans grew up with this distress, well-founded, of water. And the people who didn't drink were always um, viewed as weirdos, because why would you do right. this? Why? And right. so that idea has, has filtered down through you know, centuries now. And so sometimes people will say, well, why does it matter that they were doing this 
so, so many hundred years ago, what does this matter to us now? Uh, and, this, and my answer to that is all that is sort of, um, it's, it's built into the etiquette, it's built into socializing, it's built into how we view, how we all get together in groups and just how you describe, drinking is still very much central to socializing and, and we're gonna speak mostly just about Mar American culture right now. Um, it's so built down because of all these bits of history that have stayed with us, you know, at the, for good reason. And, 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 and now it is until recently when I, the quote that you talked about in terms of individual choice, that's what's different now because if you look at the temperance movement um, that came up uh, in the late 1800s that eventually was part of the reason that prohibition was passed, that was led by a lot by church groups. And they were basically telling people, you can't do, you have to, you can never drink. And so it was very like judgy. They're, you know, they were basically telling you they were imposing um, law, not laws, but they were imposing rules on how you can live your life. Some people chose not to drink, uh, and, and, and the people who chose not to drink were the beginning, the founders of the temperance movement, but it very, it very, it very quickly became, nobody can drink because we say so, and of course we had prohibition. Right. And then we got, and then you know that led to a backlash when prohibition um, uh, was rescinded. And so because of all this, not the non-drinker, the people who choose not to drink and sort of stand <coughs> outside of, right, uh, accepted American culture, they're still the weirdos. E you know, even as late as the 1950s and 60s, you always were, were meant to feel other and outside, and so that's why people who didn't want to drink would come up with all sorts of little reasons or little secrets or little, you know, they, t they give the bartender $20 to fill to fill a vodka bottle with water, you know, right. to make it look like they're, they're drinking martinis when it's just water. So, you know, all people do that because they were feeling uncomfortable. Um, and it isn't until quite recently, I mean, just around the time that I started researching the book, because we started having uh, all these new products out and also just a better, more informed discussion about it, that people start becoming, and, it, and then that sort of links up with the wellness, um, the wellness movement, people are making a lot of more choices, vegetarianism where it's people who still might drink, um, still might have dairy, still might have meat, but maybe are having less of it. And the same thing, people who don't drink sometimes who, who still might drink but just are drinking less right. and so if you look at the um i always compare the non-alcoholic um products and the sales in that to something like um this, the, the wild success of oatly and the impossible burger mm -hmm. the massive success of those brands are fueled by people who still eat meat and and have dairy in the same way the non-alcoholic non-alcoholic products the, those sales are powered by people who who also still drink. So 78, right. so the, according to a study from last, a market research study from, from last year, 78% um, or close to eight to 10 consumers who purchase non-alcoholic product also drink. Wow. Uh, and so, it's, and it's, there's a lot of people who drink, and there's a term that people are trying to make popular called stri striping, stri like zebra striping, oh. where, which is where you drink, you drink uh, non-alcoholic and then you, you take one on, one oh, off. Oh, okay, okay. You know, and yeah. so you might have one drink, one traditional boozy drink and right. not. Um, but anyways, but, but, but because, and I know that we're talking about the sober space here where people don't drink at all, that has sort of, in the same way that when uh, people who, who don't, who still eat meat made Impossible Burger very popular and they opened up a much larger conversation about being mindful in how you, how you eat, in the same way, the, the, the mass appeal and the mass crossover for the mass consumer is really allowing, making things more comfortable and less stigmatized right. for people in the recovery space. So it, it becomes less about having to apologize and having to explain. I always tell people, you never have, I mean, I'm sure I know who I'm talking to here, but right. a lot of consumers who still drink feel like they have to apologize and have to explain themselves. Um, and. And, and that you know that might still be something in, in your community where people feel like they have to explain I'm not drinking because of this that or the other and I always say you don't have to explain anything what you what you want to do is what you want to do and so this great this the popular the, the more as, as this as um, zero group becomes more accepted and more um, it seeps more into mass culture it makes it easier for everybody everybody whether you drink a little bit or whether you drink not you know at nothing at all whether you completely so Absolutely, and that, I mean, that, that statistic is very interesting to know that, you know, so, especially in New York, so many of these shops are opening up, which is great, and it's interesting to know that a lot of the consumers there are still drinking alcohol, and, you know, whether you're 
fully abstinent or you are sober curious, that's something that I, I think your book discusses a lot about, like the sober curious, um, and uh, or you're health conscious. Any of those steps that you're taking and having those pro those products available, it's it's great. Um, one of the things that you mentioned that I want to touch on are about making excuses. Um, when I had first uh, introduced myself to you and we were talking, one of the things that came up was um, like a pregnant person at a bar trying to hide it and having to feel the need to like whisper to the bartender and say, oh, you know, I, I don't want anyone to know, so can you make this drink look like it's alcohol? Um, and it's horrible that so many people feel the need to have to do that. Every and bartender has that story. Yes. I would oh, say 100% yeah. of bartenders have, you know, that's happened to them. Yeah. And it's crazy that a, a complete stranger is telling them. Yes, and they know not before, their, right. Not their friend. Yeah. You know, and it's, and so what's, what's interesting now, and it's, it's not everywhere, but it's catching on, is that bars are being a lot more thoughtful about the drinks, how they, how they present drinks and non-alcoholic drinks. Specifically, so it's in the same glassware. It still has the garnish. You don't look like your other, you know, the whole the, up until now, as I discussed, like people have been made to feel other, and now yeah. that we're now that people are more aware of it, you can order something off the menu, call it out by the name. It doesn't right. have to be like the non-alcoholic virgin, whatever. Yeah. You can just have a, a regular name, and it comes to you in a beautiful glass, and it's still all about what we're really. Hoping get to is that it's about an occasion it's mm -hmm. still something celebratory it's still something special right. it's still meaningful the fact that it doesn't have alcohol is doesn't play a part in the same way that you know if you go to a restaurant the vegetarian dish is made now it is if you can remember if some you know some years right. ago if you're a vegetarian or vegan you went to dinner you get I don't know, carrots you know, they'd be like <laughs> what, what do you want what, what, is what do you want from me right now yeah. but now not only are vegetarian, vegan, gluten-free dishes, not only are they presented on the menu alongside everything else, right. but they're done so thoughtfully, beautifully, elevated. elevated. Yeah. There's usually more than one option. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, the reason I keep bringing up culinary is that we, the zero group and the non-alcoholic movement is very much following in the footsteps of culinary. So all the trends that we're talking about now started in culinary. And it's and then now it's seeping over into into drinks, um, and so that's why um, I'm always paying attention to what's happening in the gluten free and the vegans and the sort of all those those diet spaces, those alt diet spaces, because as as they get more accepted and go more mainstream, we're seeing that, that you know it, it, it elevates the work that we're doing in the zero group in the zero group movements. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because it's the same kind of conversation. It's really right, the same right. conversation. So we were just talking about culinary. Let's switch gears and talk about the mocktail. Um, so the non-alcoholic drink, what I like to point out is that the non-alcoholic cocktail deserves a lot more respect than it gets because it's been part of American cocktail culture from the beginning. So American cocktails, um, excuse me, the cocktails are an American invention. The very first cocktail book is from 1862 from Jerry Thomas. and that is the foundation for a lot of craft cocktail culture and a lot of the classics that we still drink today, like the Mint Julep and Manhattan's. Temperance, they were called temperance cocktails, they were in that book. And they were mostly like just fizzy lemonades. But what that tells me is that people were always asking for these from the beginning. Right. There was a need. There was a need yeah. and that um, one of the re most respected bartenders of his time put them in the book. He gave them serious thought. He, you know, knew that people were going to be asking for them, and he included them alongside martinis and Manhattan's and mint juleps, right? So the, the the temperance cocktail deserves a lot more respect than it has been has been. Um, people have given it for many many years. Um, just really quickly, the, the word mocktail um, arrives according to the dictionary in 1916, but it really takes off in popularity in the 1980s. Um, and a lot of it, it has a terrible reputation in the AIDS because people were basically making like milkshakes and calling them mocktails. And a lot of bartenders will point out that the word mock means both to make fun of and it also means fake. So they really don't like the word. And for a very long time, they just weren't very good mocktail or non alcoholic recipes. And so that's another, yet another reason why the non alcoholic drink has had a terrible, uh, um, has had a terrible reputation up until the last. Um, you know, five, ten years or so. So what word do you use to describe them? I use zero proof. Zero proof. Not just in, it's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I use zero proof. Uh, I, I thought, I went back and forth on um, IT 
Castillo Sport. Uh, I didn't go with no proof because I didn't like that no was negative. Right. And that you're, you're defining something against what it's not. So I thought the zero proof was a, a, a much more descriptive word for it. But there's a lot of words. We spirit free, which I think is quite lovely. Mm -hmm. um, and temperance is still co is coming back. So it's whatever. And even even mocktail. Look, mocktail has is, is it, it comes up in, in Google SEO, right? So I, I right. can't I cannot <laughs> use the word because that's what people. Use. And I'm not going to judge. I don't correct anybody. Right. Okay. Whatever you want to call it, it's whatever you want to call it. It's fine by me. So what is your favorite zero proof? Beverage. <laughs> All right. uh, there's many. I love. Uh, really, I, I love everything in this book. Um, but I'm going to point out one in particular. It's called the So Fresh, So Clean. It's from Gio Lario, uh, was in Cotton Paris. It, this is one of the very first drinks I made when I was testing the book. It is so so special because it's the, you know the best idea about a, a cocktail is that it's greater than the sum of its parts. So this is a, it's in terms of putting it together. It's quite simple. It's basically like you're making a tea. So you're getting chamomile and lavender, you're letting it sit for overnight, and then you get this beautiful cordial, and then you're adding some kombucha. I'm leaving out a bit, but it's really that simple. It's just you take some, some dried some dried teas, you let it sit overnight, wow. and then you put it and you strain it, and then the next day you put it together, and it tastes amazing. It's very low effort. Um, the recipes here might require time, but they don't they're not they don't require a lot of effort. A lot of it is just like almost like making a soup. Put something together, you let it sit, and then you strain it, and you have something wonderful afterwards that you can have for yourself or you have to show off at a party. That's amazing. I can't wait to look at this book further. There's so many amazing recipes in there. Elva, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Join us tomorrow for our next episode of Socializing Sober. We're going to go into some strategies that are going to help navigating uh, parties. And join us on Friday where we'll have our final episode live at our Sands Bar event with Chris Marshall. We're looking forward to seeing all of you there. Tickets are still available. Go to bigvisioncommunity.com and check out our upcoming events. You'll see the, tickets, the ticket link there or on the top of our webpage, you'll be able to get tickets there. Thank you so much and tune in tomorrow.